Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome to HNRCA's first uh, seminar of the season, which we are very happy to be sharing with the sort of unofficial microbiome group at Tufts, which uh, has been meeting for, for a while. And uh, we're fortunate to have as our first speaker for the seminar series and, and um, uh, Marty Obine, one of our uh, scientists at the, at the center. Uh, I don't think that um, I need to give a long introduction for Marty. Uh, all of you know him quite well and have had uh, discussions with him one way or the other. Um, but um, I was actually quite interested to know that he got his BA in religion from Wesleyan University and then his PhD in um, university in zoology from University of Florida. So that by itself just explained Marty to me. I mean, the, the, free, <laughs> the free thinker that he, he is. And we've been fortunate to have him since 1995 as a scientist at the center, first with our nutrition and vision lab, and then with the uh, obesity and metabolism lab. And, and he's been making significant contribution to both of the laboratories. And, in general, I think Marty is a great resource for all of our scientists and a student as well. And today he's going to be talking about an area that he has recently gotten into, which is uh, probiotics and microbiota and um, its relationship to metabolic syndrome and use of animal uh, models. Marty? Thank you, Samin. Can you everybody hear me? Thank you, Samin. And uh, thank everyone else for coming, especially I know grants are due and um, everybody's in a rush. So I'm going to whip through a bunch of slides. Um, there's going to be some physiology. There's going to be some microbiology. There's going to be some statistical jujitsu. Um, no one is expected to follow everything. Um, but then there'll be summaries both during the presentation at the end so you can doze off when the heat maps show up and then wake up and actually know what, sort of know what happened. Okay, so we now know that humans are superorganisms, or what we call holobionts, uh, defined by Mendel, composed of 10% human cells and 90% microbial cells. Importantly, the health and survival of both have co-evolved to become inextricably intertwined. So the human has basically uh, a s five habitats, major habitats for um, the microbiome. There's the uh, oral, nasal, and respiratory, skin, urogenital, and the intestine, gastrointestinal system. As a consequence of this coevolution, vital host metabolic pathways and physiological responses are regulated by what we call crosstalk, either metabolic co-regulation or um, secondary co-regulation between the host and the gut microbial community or the gut microbiota that I'll be focusing on today. So perhaps not surprisingly, due to this coevolution and the interdependence, the chronic disruption of the gut microbiota, a term officially known as dysbiosis, has emerged as both a feature and potential cause of various human pathological states, including obesity, whoop, metabolic syndrome, and, and other cardiometabolic maladies um, that we'll be focusing on today. So normobiosis was uh, defined by the International Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics in 2008 as a normal gut microbiota in which general, sp generous species of microorganisms with potential health benefits predominate in number over potentially harmful ones. Vague, but it gives you a sense that good is outweighing bad, whatever that actually means. And dysbiosis is a gut microbiota in which one of a few potentially harmful genera of microorganisms are dominant, thus creating a disease-prone situation. Now, disease-prone situation is um, quite heterogeneous, but basically it's the loss of every individual's internally most appropriate and metabolically homeostatic uh, gut microbiota. So now let's turn to the metabolic syndrome, which we all know is a constellation of overweight and obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, hyperinsulinemia, and insulin resistance. Importantly, in terms of morbidity and mortality, components of metabolic syndrome, each of these, both individually and together, are known risk factors for the development of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, certain cancers, asthma, and obstructive sleep apnea. So 
as we now move into after this review, one last final step, which will be to review how obesity, overweight obesity, and the metabolic syndrome progresses. So I, this is a slide I modified from something, a nice slide of Andy's. We all know that adipose tissue in response to overnutrition and sedentary lifestyle, that fat cells here get larger, producing, at least in men, the uh, visceral adipose, adipose phenotype. This leads to the increase in free fatty acids, adipokines, immune cell recruitment to fat, shown here by these crown-like structures uh, discovered in the Obesity and Metabolism Lab in, co uh, uh, co in collaboration with Severio Chinti. And here we see an adipocyte lipid droplet surrounded by inflammatory macrophages. This produces adipose tissue inflammation, which results in ectopic fat deposition in, in liver and reduced fat oxidation in muscle leading to a series of uh, peripheral events, insulin resistance in muscle, insulin resistance in liver, leading to uh, increased gluconeogenesis, increased lipidemia, and altered insulin secretion in the pancreas, all resulting in metabolic syndrome and its progression of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So the take home from here is that each one of those steps, each one of these getting fat, getting inflammation, ectopic fat, reduced fat oxidation, insulin resistance, events in the liver, every one of these has been implicated. Uh, gut dysbiosis has been implicated in every one of those features of that scheme over the last two decades. Okay, so the normobiosis, what we talked about is health, in lean metabolically healthy individuals is homeostatic co-regulation of body weight and adiposity, insulin, glucose, lipid, bile acid, and short-chain fatty acid metabolism, something we call normal. And also the maintenance of the intestinal barrier function and protection bacterial translocation from the lumen to the host. We'll talk more about this. So there's metabolic homeostasis and protection from inflammation. In obesity-associated dysbiosis, we have this dysregulation of both the metabolic pathways involving uh, carbohydrate metabolism, lipid, and um, bile acid metabolism, and we also have compromised barrier function that promotes inflammation, a concept recently termed metabolic endotoxemia. And I'll be focusing on uh, features of the dysregulated metabolism, certainly not going to cover all of it because it's very complex, and also the compromised barrier function. So here's an example of, uh, we're going to use a little scheme here that covers just some of the features of what goes on, of how the uh, microbiota regulates critical uh, host metabolic pathways that would, might be involved in metabolic syndrome. So the first is the regulation of the uh, secretion from the intestine, uh, uh, enteroendocrine cells, uh, rather the epithelial cells, of angiopoietin-like 4, also known as FIAF, which is a potent inhibitor of LPL. So when the, during dysbiosis, this is decreased. LPL is much more active, storing triglycerides in adipose tissue, which grows. And also in co combination with reduced angiopoietin-like 4, you have decreased skeletal muscle beta oxidation, fat oxidation. So less burning, less metabolic burning of fat, more fat deposition. Short chain fatty acids are produced by the gut microbiota and they have multiple functions. Uh, one is through uh, GPR41, uh, is the uh, signaling pathway that can lead to the number of uh, gut peptide secretions from uh, enteroendocrine cells. PYY, which regulates um, a number of things, including uh, uh, transit of food through the uh, intestine, um, as well as hepatic lipogenesis. Short-chain fatty acids, uh, we're here we're talking about acetate and butyrate, can also directly uh, increase uh, GLP-1, which produces insulin sensitivity, insulin release, and is a satiety factor. So there's this balance normally in normal biosis of short-chain fatty acids acting on metabolic axes through neuroendocrine system. In addition, gut microbiota generates secondary bile acids. We all know this, but it turns out that they're having an increasingly more potent role in the regulation of uh, metabolism, including the actual regulation of bile, primary bile acid metabolism itself. So secondary bile acids now are recently shown uh, can block FXR signaling in both the liver and uh, in the uh, jejunum, this ends up producing 
um, a block on actually the production of bile acids. And secondary bile acids through uh, TGR5 signal through cyclic AMP, again, to increase the release of GLP-1, uh, a gut peptide that regulates insulin secretion, satiety, and gastric emptying. Now, under normal biosis, these are balanced along with many other features of uh, the metabolic pathway, carbohydrate, lipid, and protein metabolism. These all become dysregulated. We'll show it later, talk about it a bit later, um, in obesity leading to metabolic syndrome. Now, we also talked about inflammation. And we said that microbial translocation from the gut promotes obesity-associated inflammation. This is known as metabolic endotoxemia. So we all know about adipose tissue inflammation. In diabetes and obesity, you have enlarged fat cells, chemokines are expressed, macrophages come in, um, you have uh, endotoxin that's uh, produced, and we'll talk about where it comes from, and you have a change in both um, M1T, a macrophage, um, and innate and adaptive immunity from a uh, basically suppressed to a um, Th1 or M1 state. We have known this for a long time. Now, in the intestine, it is critical that the intestinal epithelial cells maintain tight junctions and barrier function, especially during chylomicrine uh, egress uh, following a postprandially with a fat meal. So it turns out that uh, GLP-2, uh, a gut peptide, and through, also signaling things through toll-like receptor 2 are very important in maintaining this tight junction. Here, these little squiggles here, uh, that's endotoxin. This is the lumen. And we see here that with the tight junctions, Basically, dendritic cells and macrophages are essentially quiescent. Their sur surveillance activity is, is uh, always in place, but they're not challenged with endotoxin. In obesity uh, and leading to diabetes, we see that the barrier is broken. We have egress or translocation of not only endotoxin, but now it's also known actual intact bacteria, or bacteremia, across the uh, intestinal uh, cells actually now to activate dendritic cells and start a adaptive immune response that's currently under investigation. This is associated with reduced GLP-2 and reduced toll-like receptor signaling. One of the things we'll talk about today with probiotics, we'll talk about in particular obviously lactobacillus, lactic acid bacteria, and bifidobacteria. And GLP-2 turns out to be a product or at least produced or generated by bifidobacteria, and lactobacillus are potent signalers through toll-like receptor 2 at this interface. So, what about studies? So there are innumerable studies showing that a reduction in beneficial bacteria and increases in pro-inflammatory or pathogenic bacteria, such as uh, sulfur pr uh, producing bacteria, are consistently associated with the development of obesity, adipose and intestinal inflammation, and metabolic comorbidities. In both humans and rodents, there are dozens and dozens of studies that show this. In fact, some species of gut bacteria are now causally implicated in obesity and the development of metabolic syndrome, directly implicated. So uh, Enterobacter cloaca, B29, was recently isolated from obese human, put into germ-free mice, and shown to promote obesity uh, directly, just this one uh, strain. Uh, in contrast, the mucin degrading commensal, which actually lives and uh, quite successfully in the uh, mucin layer of our intestine, the Acromantium mucinophila, has recently been shown to actually just by itself reduce high fat diet induced obesity and comorbidities, making almost no detectable changes in the rest of the gut microbiota. So one species can go and cause obesity, and another species can like absolutely protect against it, and that suggests that there are very specific, when we get fine, fine grained with our analysis of the microbiota, that they'll be, we'll be able to mine it for, for a fantastic number of uh, new, um, basically, mi microbial uh, pharmaceuticals or microbe-based pharmaceuticals. Okay, now that's mice and humans, and um, what about, what do we know about 
the direct effects, and that's you, the, the point in those studies is usually lean versus obese case control. I found this study particularly exciting because um, it, it shows that the gut microbiota profile is associated with insulin action in humans. And these are humans, the same morbidly obese BMI, 56 and 55.8 and 54.2. These are insulin sensitive and these are insulin resistant. There's a large cohort of individuals who are known as metabolically healthy obese. They are insulin sensitive that is to say metabolically healthy despite obesity. And we see here that their insulins are dramatically lower than individuals of similar BMI who are insulin resistant. Their glucose is lower, their total HOMA IR is lower. And when you look at the fecal microbiota of these individuals, they're the insulin sensitive and the insulin resistant, the take home from doing a gel analysis is that the insulin resistant and the insulin sensitive have almost this, this very clearly distinguishable uh, bands on these gels. There are only four overlapping bands. So this is a, a relatively small study. Uh, I think it was like 16 individuals and yet had high predictive value. Now, even more compelling is the notion that you can transfer the microbiota from lean donors, again, case control, lean donors, and give them to obese uh, individuals with metabolic syndrome and actually rescue metabolic syndrome. You can actually uh, use them as a health, um, as a actual intervention. So this paper from Max Newdorp's group, um, let me just walk you through it briefly. So um, all these individuals are, let me just go through there. There's uh, lean controls, and this is before, this is, all these, these two uh, groups of people are getting their own um, they're getting gut microbiota from a lean individual. Here are the lean controls, and here's the gut microbiota from the lean, indi lean individual. These people are getting their own gut microbiota. So here's the lean. These are the obese. These four groups here are obese. And we're looking at um, peripheral insulin sensitivity. I think this was done by Clamp. And you can see that lean, obese, these people get their own gut microbiota. These people get gut microbiota from lean individuals, and their insulin sensitivity is significantly increased. This is hepatic insulin sensitivity. Again, a trend. This is the lean. This is the obese getting their uh, own gut microbiota. These are individuals getting uh, gut microbiota from lean individuals. So that shows direct effects of gut microbiota as a whole, not just as one individual strain, um, as, a, as a potential therapy. So taken together, these observations support the concept that targeting obesity-associated gut dysbiosis is an effective approach. Obviously, along with prebiotics and uh, combination therapies, um, it's, a, it's an exciting area. So that turn, gets us to turn to probiotics. Most of you know not only what they are and what they do, but I mean, many of you have been working in the area for, for quite some time with tremendous expertise. For at least the last 4,000 years, lactic acid bacteria, which, which are one of the major probiotic groups used, have been used to ferment or culture foods. So they've been used for a long time. Um, I didn't know when I got into this field that uh, the great Mechnikoff, winner of the Nobel Prize, thought it was possible to modify the gut flora and replace harmful microbes with useful microbes and actually proposed the role of putrefaction, that is to say, the um, predominance of proteolytic gut microbiota in aging. He actually had a theory of aging which involved gut microbiota in 1907. Um, the definition was microbially derived factors that stimulate the growth of other microorganisms. This was changed. Um, by Fuller in 1989, there were others involved as a live microbial feed supplement which beneficially affects the host animal, and here's the key, by approving its intestinal microbial balance, that is the notion of normobiosis. This just shows that uh, the number of PubMed citations in the keyword probiotic from 1954 to 1998, there are approximately 100, 1999 to 2003, 2004 to 2008, 2009, present, it's basically doubling every year we'll come back to this concept of even though it's doubling, what's the problem with um, translation of probiotic uh, science? And um, hopefully we can get to that at the end. Okay, more background. A variety of probiotic strains, often as cocktails, have been used to ameliorate obesity, insulin resistance, and hepatic steatosis in rodents. There are many experiments that show this. Typically, these are the species used, lactobacillus, 
uh, and bifidobacterium are, they've been vetted for many years as probiotics, first because this has been used in uh, uh, food and has been used uh, to, to culture uh, fermented food for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, and bifidobacterium were isolated in, I guess, the 20s or 30s. Uh, someone will correct me, from human breast milk. So these two are pretty vetted. They've been used for thousands of years. Uh, Streptococcus thermophilus is also, as well as gut commensals, that is to say, gut bacteria that actually live in our own gut and can be um, perhaps modified, people are talking about modifying for enhanced activity. That's Bacteroides uniformis, and I mentioned Acromantia mucinophila. Okay, well how do they work? How do these, how do probiotics potentially uh, confer metabolic protection? Well, there are many, uh, this is sort of traditional view, and then there's the, the more uh, modern uh, data, the more current data. One is that they create an optical environment, typically because of lactic acid producers, this notion of low pH, favoring a saccharolytic versus proteolytic species, that is to say, um, antagonizing putrefaction. Uh, they compete for nutrients with pathogenic species. These are all um, the hypotheses of how they work. We know that they secre secrete antimicrobial peptides, and we've also discussed how they maintain mucosal and epithelial integrity. That's what I showed you here, the necessary, the importance of GLP-2 and toll-like receptor 2 signaling for maintaining the healthy gut barrier function. And more and more re recently, and with more uh, compelling data, especially from uh, Gordon's lab and twin studies, and um, now many of the European studies using metabolomics, Modulation of adiposity and carbohydrate lipid metabolism via direct effects on adipose tissue. I'm not going to discuss today the release of conjugated linoleic acid and how that affects adiposity. And via numerous indirect enteroendocrine actions that we've already presented about that go wrong in obesity. So we know that probiotic studies have shown can rectify or interact with the uh, decrease in angiopoietin like four, decrements in short chain fatty acids, and alter secondary bile acids to make a more normal biotic milieu. Okay, so that's the background. Ah. So it turns out that we don't really have an understanding of how probiotics behave in different contexts and in different individuals. And when we talk about um, why there is no um, actual health claim that's been approved for probiotics, um, it in, in part boils down to that specific physiological functions and mechanisms are highly strain specific and that strain selection can be crucial to demonstrate functional efficacy. So I'm now going to talk about our use of next generation sequencing and a murine model of diet induced obesity. And we're going to identify strain specific effects of probiotics on actual fecal microbiota and their potential relationships of these effects on the microbiota to specific features of metabolic syndrome pathophysiology. So we're going to run a model, we're going to make the mice fat, we're going to give them metabolic syndrome, we're going to look at a whole bunch of things that occur with obesity pathophysiologically, we're going to sequence the microbiota, and then we're going to do statistical jujitsu. Okay? And what I want to emphasize is this is not hypothesis testing. This is exploratory data analysis. In other words, you could not go to the FDA with anything that you pull out of these sorts of studies and go, Aha, here is something that works. But these are the, the critical techniques for generating hypotheses that can then be followed up either in culture, in batch culture, in, in fermentation culture, uh, fecal water experiments, and more importantly, in germ-free mice. Okay? So even though this, this will, you'll see lots of correlations and lots of interesting things, I'm aware, as the whole field is aware, that this is merely hypothesis generating. Okay, so Danon research decided to test three proprietary strains, um, Lactobacillus paracase, and we're going to call this LC. You'll see it as LC throughout the data presentation. Uh, Lactobacillus rhamnosus, um, a specific strain, that's going to be LR, and Bifidobacterium animalis, subspecies lactis, that's going to be BA. So we have LC, LR, and BA, two Lactobacillus species and uh, a strain of Bifidobacterium. Okay, we'll run through the study design. Basically, five groups of mice, N equals eight per group. You have some getting a normal chow, a group getting a lard-based high-fat diet, um, overkill, so they're supersizing every day, 
and receiving 200 microliters of a placebo broth, and then th groups three, four, and five fed the high-fat diet plus bacterial suspension of either one of the three probiotics at a dose of 10 to the 8 cells per day for 12 weeks. We collect various tissues, run adipose tissue, liver, jejunum, and cecum. We run oral glucose tolerance tests, and we do um, lots of ELISAs. Uh, we do fasting glucose, insulin, lipopolyside binding protein, which is a sort of indirect measure of uh, LPS, uh, metabolic endotoxemia, and adiponectin. Um, lots of real-time PCR for inflammation, and we do sequel short-chain fatty acids and branch-chain fatty acids by gas chromatography. Okay, so we also do 454 pyrosequencing, the V3 region of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. Those are the primers. And this is a quick run-through of just how it was analyzed. Anybody wants to talk about how we did, you know, selected high-quality reads and the basic details of how the sequencing was done and the uh, workflow, we can talk later. We aligned, the uh, sequences were aligned in green genes. They were clustered in a cluster database at high density with tolerance, CD hit. Uh, unique sequences were obtained. Phylogeny using the RDP database. And then the definite, we described operational taxonomic units, which we work through with in our statistical analysis, were classified with DOTOR. And alpha diversity was assessed with rarefaction and Shannon diversity and other richness and diversity indices, and beta diversity with the usual principal component and principal coordinates, that is to say, weighted based on Unifrac, um, based on the OTUs. This is very standard, nothing fancy here. Um, then we did a series of ordination techniques uh, and, and developed models were constructed to identify operational taxonomic units. Sometimes I'll use the term phylotype, which just means an OTU down at sort of the species level, to distinguish pairs of treatment groups. You'll see the presentation. Um, it's to decide what is actually different with multiple, um, com hundreds of multiple comparisons between the different groups to try to identify meaningful uh, phylotypes that were associated with disease state. Okay, so the first thing we determined in the results was that probiotic strains were continuously present in the GI tract at constant levels. That's important. You're feeding them probiotic. You need to know that it's being maintained in the system. Um, this is uh, two weeks, six weeks, and 12 weeks. And this is a uh, high-fat diet. I can't see, my, I should be wearing my other glasses. Ah, here's high fat diet plus uh, LC. Here's his high fat diet and normal chow. And this is high fat diet and LC. So this is um, one of the lactobacillus species. And we see that there's increase and it's maintained over each of the three time periods. This is high fat diet plus uh, lactobacillus rhamnosus. High levels, much higher than either high fat or the control. You'll notice that high fat diet has no effect even after 12 weeks on these species. Well, maybe it's getting a little bit less. And then over here we have uh, the bifidobacterium species. And you'll notice that by, I guess by six and 12 weeks, bifidobacterium were almost gone from both the high fat diet and normal diet um, mouse, but were maintained high in the probiotic. This shows the weight gain. Uh, obviously, all probiotic strains, the three of them are here generated intermediate weight gain over the low-fat diet, the normal diet, and the high-fat diet, essentially equivalent. This was not due to any change in energy intake. So there, some probiotics can actually, we discussed the fact that they might act through a satiety network through GLP-1. Um, mouse, mice ate, this is aggregate over a week at a time, the same amount of food, and there was no difference in leptin. So the fact is the mice were leaner, and it was not due to energy intake, which we assumed would happen, that there would be an effect on satiety. Okay, now for the results that follow, I'm going to tell you what, what I'm actually going to show. First, each of the three strains attenuated adiposity, glucose intolerance, and hepatic steatosis, fairly much the same. However, the three strains differentially affected host inflammation and f microbial fermentation. And although all probiotic strains partially reversed obesity-induced structural changes in the gut microbiota, each strain selectively altered a specific set of key species that we'll discuss that were associated with particular features of MS development. And that's really, to us, that's sort of the interesting take-home. They were, all three probiotics worked, 
and you could actually think of putting them together in a combination, which frequently is done with probiotics. But we were interested in how particular species alterations in the microbiota could be correlated or associated with different features of metabolic syndrome. Okay, so let's start with glucose insulin homeostasis and hepatic steatosis. Back up here. Ah, I can see. Uh, we, here's nor this is weight gain, which I showed you is essentially intermediate between normal chow and the high fat. Here's fasting blood glucose, normal high fat diet, and here's fasting insulin, normal high fat diet, and we see reductions in both glucose and insulin, producing a substantial difference in the um, homeostatic assessment of, uh, of insulin resistance in this model. Chow, high fat diet, reduced all three. What we expected, this is an oral glucose tolerance test. Again, high fat, much less glucose uh, tolerant than the normal chow fed with intermediates resulting from probiotic intervention. Here's the area under the curve for this. Normal chow, very low, high fat diet, and significant differences. Well, it, uh, certainly a, a, a solid trend for reduction here, although this bifidobacterium is, in fact, intermediate between the high-fat diet and these others. It's a, a little bit higher. Same with uh, hepatic steatosis. This is normal chow. All this white area is high-fat diet. That's uh, macrosteatosis. And each of the three probiotic uh, strains uh, successfully reduced it, although the um, LC, this one here, seemed to do much less, was much less effective than the bifidobacterium species. Okay, so basically that looked what we expected. What we um, were surprised to see was that tissue and systemic inflammation was evidence for enhanced actions of the bifidobacterium. So this is a histology that we use to look for these crown-like structures, which are macrophage inflammatory foci. They're measured over here. This is immunohistochemistry. This is the number of macrophages in fat, in normal chow and high fat diet, and dramatically reduced by all three strains, uh, in particular uh, the bifidobacterium. Um, MMP12 is secreted by these um, uh, macrophages and is a uh, pretty good indicator of um, M1 activation in these cells. Very low in normal chow, high fat diet. The three strains reduce MMP12. Um, the three strains reduce other macrophage markers of inflammation, CD11C. And here's TNF alpha RNA. We see very much increased in um, fat by high fat diet, dramatically reduced down to normal chow levels by bifidobacterium. Um, here's MCP1, increased, decreased by probiotics. Um, and here's uh, adiponectin, which is uh, very surprising. So here's high fat, uh, normal chow, very high, high fat diet, it goes down. Here's bifidobacterium, dramatically. Uh, increased relative to the uh, high-fat diet. These aren't st statistically significant with uh, groups of eight. There's, uh, you know, outliers for each one. But we uh, see that across the board, there's reductions in inflammation, increase in adiponectin, in adipose tissue. In the liver, again, here's uh, TNF, low, increased by high-fat diet. Bifidobacterium seems to do better at its reduction. Here's the jejunum, again, low in normal chow, high in high fat diet, TNF, uh, again, seemingly more suppressed by bifidobacterium. And here's serum lipopolysaccharide binding protein, elevated in high fat diet. Uh, sorry, this is, yeah, this is uh, circulating and reduced more so by the bifidobacterium. And um, again, serum adiponectin, um, high, low by high fat diet, raised up by all three, but m somewhat, but mostly by the bifidobacterium. Okay, so there seemed to be a trend that bifidobacterium were at least producing both tissue-wise and systemically a slightly more enhanced inflammatory uh, protection. So what about short-chain fatty acids, which I told you were important in metabolic co-regulation? Um, here we see that lactobacillus uh, were the only ones that um, ameliorated anything having to do with uh, short-chain fatty acid changes due to high-fat diet. They um, actually ameliorate some of the reductions in cecal acetate. So here's acetic acid. Here's uh, normal chow. High-fat diet is reduced. And we see that the two lactobacillus species are significantly higher than the high-fat diet. 
There are no other changes, no significant changes in uh, propionate or in butyrate, although we know that it does drop as predicted in the high fat diet. These are branch chain fatty acids where we saw no trends. Okay. How are we doing for time? Okay, the pyrosequencing. All right, we got lots of reads. They were all about in the right size as predicted, and it was an average of about 3,800 reads. We got 21,000 unique sequences. They were generated um, with elastinimate and CD hit clustering, and they were binned at 98% similarity level, which is normally not done, but we actually checked to make sure that we weren't looking at um, basically noise or subspecies by plotting um, the uh, number of um, increase in OTUs uh, as we increased uh, similarity from 97 to 98. So even though we, um, this is number of sequences, the number of, of, uh, of OTUs, you can see we, we did not all of a sudden just start taking off. In fact, we didn't even get to uh, an equilibrium. So it suggests that rare new phylotypes would still appear with um, further sequencing, but most diversity had already been covered. This is Shannon for all of the treatments. And surprisingly, we did not see um, an inc uh, increase or a decrease in diversity on high-fat diet. Two new papers have come out talking about richness and diversity as key elements of metabolic health. You can just look at richness, this number of species that are there, um, as in human and, and mouse metabolic health, but we didn't see that. Here, for example, the high-fat diet is here, right in the middle. Um, so we didn't see what we expected. We expected it to be down here. Here's one mouse that's down there. Okay, so what happened to the microbiota? The high-fat diet dramatically altered relative <laughs> abundance of four predominant phyla. Um, so we look at firmicutes and bacteroides, the classic and the firmicute bacteroides ratio goes what significantly up. Uh, this is uh, expected on high fat diet and it's somewhat attenuated but not much. Where we saw changes and uh, these had to do pretty much with um, LR, rhamnosis, was in um, proteobacteria and actinobacteria. That they was, these were um, maintained at normal chow levels, whereas they increased on a high-fat diet in the other three treatments. And over here, actinobacteria decreased under high-fat diet, but increased by lactobacillus rhamnosus. Okay, so now we have to do, so now we're gonna do some statistical jujitsu. And one way is because there's, we have to look at the entire microbiome. The traditional technique is to use multidimensional scaling to see if they are actually different. Yeah, we got one phyla was this way and one phyla went down. And, but when you take all of the OTUs, 21,000 OTUs, are they really different? So we use multidimensional scaling, excuse me. So three principal uh, coordinate axes, and we're plotting uh, normal chow is the blue, high fat diet is the sort of pink, and then here are the three um, probiotic treatments sort of clustered in the middle. And when we use uh, analysis of variance, using these distances, uh, we can cluster them um, between the different groups. And we plot the actual Mahalanobis distance here. Here's normal chow. This is the distance its total um, principal coordinates are from the high-fat diet. So high-fat diet is very different from normal chow. And then, in fact, both the, um, all three probiotic treatments are significantly l different in terms of Mahalanobis distance than the high-fat diet here is LR and here's BA and LC. So that there is, um, let's go back. There is, we can say that each strain reduced the structural segregation between normal chow and high fat diet. That is say the entire microbiome. Okay, we can then take these multiple measures. Now that we know that the, the distances and the principal coordinates axis tell us something, we can ask, do these different distances correlate with any of the features of metabolic syndrome? And I'm just throwing up the physiological parameters, principal coordinate one, principal, sorry, principal component one, principal component two, and principal com component three from the axes I just showed you. And we have all of the interesting physiological parameters, serum adiponectin, adiponectin RNA, weight gain, area under the curve of the glucose tolerance test, inflammatory, all the way down. And everything in yellow is a significant correlation. So for example, we have weight gain is negatively associated with principal coordinate one. Now we told you the principal coordinate one 
very much influences this, this, the actual structural segregation of the microbiota. So we're using indices, axes, that describe and allow us to de detect or at least explain differences in community composition, and these are positively associated with features, in particular HOMA IR um, and inflammation. Liver TNF is not, but jejunum TNF is with the actual gut microbiota. But this is at a whole community structure level. We need to identify specific genera or phylotypes whose relative abundance changes in response to treatments. We showed that there's a, we can take the whole three coordinates of the principal components. Can we do it with individuals? And this gets us into something that was taught to me by collaborators, and I'm still having trouble doing it or thinking about it. It's called redundancy analysis, which is a form of canonical correlation analysis. It's an ordination technique where you take biplots, and in this case, we hold each of the treatments as constrained variables and then run a canonical correlation analysis. I'm not going to show you all of those biplots, but when they're all done running high fat diet versus normal chow, high fat diet versus probiotic one, normal chow versus probiotic one, you can generate a heat map. And what came out of that was out of the 2,700 2, OTUs, we come up with 89 that have altered abundances. Some are decreased by high fat diet and increased by probiotics. Whoop. This group here and some were increased by high fat diet and decreased by probiotics, this group here. So here are the OTUs, here's the heat map, so here's normal chow, and it goes from a sort of yellow to a darker blue, it's decreased by high fat diet, and we see more yellow in each of the three probiotic strains. So this is decreased by high fat diet, increased by probiotics. Here we have the opposite, increased by high fat diet, blue to yellow, and in parts decreased by probiotics at different levels. And these are the species here. You can't read them all, I'll, I'll summarize them, but this is how, and this is the phylogeny. So here's uh, phylum, family, and genus. We can then take these spearmint correlations and look at them for each of the individual OTUs. And this is really the power of this technique. Again, for hypothesis generating. Wherever you see red, there's a positive association between these 49 OTUs, well, we took 49 of these OTUs, there's a positive correlation where it's red between that OTU, that phylotype, and these features of metabolic syndrome. So here we have uh, serum adiponectin, we have weight gain, we have area near the curve, um, we have, I can't read it here, HOMA IR, and we have all the inflammatory indices here. So here, for example, we see a whole bunch of species, Bifidobacterium ulcinella, Barnsiella alabaculum, that are positively associated with serum adiponectin. It's a good thing to have, okay? These OTUs here. And down here, we see a bunch of species that are negatively associated with adiponectin. Blue, negative association. So all of these guys who are good with adiponectin, promote adiponectin, are negatively associated with weight gain, inflammation, macrophages, and the sort of metabolic syndrome features, these that are inversely associated or inversely correlated with adiponectin are all positively associated with these bad features of metabolic syndrome. And so these species are, or groups are listed here. We'll summarize them. I know you can't read it from that, from that point. In here, the open circles, they're more abundant in probiotic groups and, and lean mice relative to high fat group. So the, this is more abundant makes sense, and these which are negatively correlated with adiponectin and positively correlated with poor outcomes in metabolic syndrome, the dark circles mean that they are uh, less abundant in the probiotics groups and normal chow relative to high fat diet. Okay, so here's the summary. In total, 49 OTUs were significantly correlated with one metabolic syndrome parameter, including all 31 OTUs whose abundances were altered by high fat diet and reversed by probiotics. So everything that was changed by high fat diet and reversed by, pro, by, uh, by probiotics, 31 of those was associated with at least one metabolic syndrome parameter. 15 of these OTUs were negatively correlated, whereas 34 were positively correlated with metabolic syndrome features. 13 that were negatively correlated were enriched by at least one probiotic strain, 
including bacteria belonging to Bifidobacterium, Olsenella, Barnsiella, Alabaculum, Buterovibrio, some unclassified Lactinospiraceae, and unclassified Proteobacteria. These were negatively correlated, that is to say when they're um, in high amounts, there's less metabolic syndrome features, and they were enriched by at least one probiotic strain. On the other hand, 26, sorry about that, were positively correlated with metabolic syndrome features, they're sort of the bad guys, um, and they were reduced by probiotic treatment, including representatives from Allostypes, Desofibrionaceae, Oscillobacter, Clostridium, Cluster 14b, Doria, and Clostridium 14a. So, let's take the Venn diagrams to just sort of show you how, you know, sort of the take home here, which is that we have three probiotic strains. We have LC, LR, the two uh, lactobacillus strains, and we have Bifidobacterium animalis. These are strains that are either up or down, as we said, either positively or negatively associated with metabolic syndrome features, and the take home is that only five are actually the same, or shared between the three different interventions. So only five OTUs were commonly changed by all three probiotics, However, 31 of the 49 OTUs were changed by just one strain, okay? So the predominant number of, of uh, phylotypes that were associated with metabolic syndrome, most of those were changed by just one individual strain. Thus, each of the three probiotic strains altered a distinct set of gut bacterial phylotypes and, to some extent, different obesity complications of metabolic syndrome. So, for example, Compared to BA, strains LC and LR increased more phylotypes belonging to the acetate-producing genus Barnsiella, and coincidentally elevated acetate production. I showed you, they were the only ones who elevated acetate production. Acetate suppresses adipose accumulation and inflammation in obese diabetic rodents by multiple mechanisms we're not going to go into. In, uh, alternatively, only BA increased bifidobacterium which fortify gut barrier function, I showed you, we, about through uh, GLP-2, thereby protecting against metabolic endotoxemia that promotes insulin resistance. Uh, BA, but neither LC nor LR, significantly reduced adipose and hepatic TNF-alpha gene expression and tended to lower circulating LPS. In other words, we have a sort of, a, they call it in evolutionary biology, a just-so story. You have this result, and oh yeah, that explains that result. Again, this is just hypothesis testing. So here we have more, we have uh, Barnes, Barnesiella, produces lots of acetate, it's a very good acetate producer. We see changes in acetate only with LC and LR. Here we have increased bifidobacterium, which we know are important in gut barrier function. There's a tendency for us to see less metabolic endotoxemia. These observations exemplify how strain-specific impacts of probiotics on key but bacterial phylotypes may, and I say may, be reflected in strain-specific impacts on obesity complications. Strain-specific impacts on obesity complications, maybe. Okay, so just to close, I just want to say that um, that showed you all of the increases in studies of probiotics, prebiotics. It's a fascinating area. Um, with all that said, there's no health claims. Can't be done. Hasn't been done. And some of the studies are fantastic, but we got nothing so far. Now, a contributing factor is like, there are many, but one is that humans are not mice, which was convey, con conveyed to me by Susan Freed. Um, I was stunned. <laughs> well, what do we mean by this? So here's an example of microbiota heterogeneity in human study cohorts. What I'm going to show is not, you all know that each individual human has a very different microbiota composition, both in terms of uh, taxonomy as well as, um, you know, functional uh, the metagenome. But what I want to point out is that because humans are not strains of mice, they're not identical twins essentially, living in the exact same environment, eating the exact same food the way our mice are, when you recruit for a clinical, any sort of clinical study, you may have to stratify based on the gut microbiota. So here are data from a study that um, uh, Nicola McCune uh, and a group of us did uh, to look at um, whole fi fiber fortification of humans. And this is a very small study. This just looks at 12 people who were put on a very complicated crossover study and washout. It was beautifully designed. And it was chaos to look at it at the end. And when we sat and decided to look at the each, we, we took microbiota, fecal microbiota for each person, all 12 people, every week. Well, so we looked at the starting. And at the start, 
we found out that the group was stratified, our, 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 um, the cohort was totally stratified according to enterotype. Enterotype being a reflection of the gut microbiota composition that indicates long-term diet, and it's well known. So here we have, this is a, a log score, this is using uh, the LDA, the LEFSA program of uh, Sagata and Huttenauer. This is like discriminant analysis. So what discriminates one group of people is high amounts of Prevotola, what discriminates the other group of people with high amounts of Bacteroidetes and Ruminococcus, and of course, not only that, but this produces a completely different balance of Firmicutes to Bacteroidetes, which is one of the classics that we are supposed to uh, acknowledge as driving metabolic health. A high Firmicutes to Bacteroidetes ratio is indicative of poor, less optimal metabolic health in terms of glucose and uh, lip, uh, carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. So the notion of people, uh, you, you don't have mice. You may have to stratify or, or else use huge amounts of, of populations. Here's another in, uh, example. This is within individual variability in so-called stable OTU host relationships. These are the same people sampled weekly. One of the things that we determined um, to just check, because we expected it, that was BMI of the individuals would be positively associated with the species Rosburia. And this just shows you when we sample weekly, the variability in something as simple. This is the percent of Roseburia in the microbiome. And you can see tremendous variability in the same individual, even though the BMI is not changing. Okay. So in summary and conclusion, we demonstrate the utility of two lactobacillus and one bifidobacterium strain to attenuate high fat diet induced obesity, inflammation, and metabolic syndrome. One or more probiotic strains beneficially altered the abundance of 49, we call key bacterial phylotypes that were associated with metabolic syndrome. Most were selectively altered by only one probiotic strain, suggesting that the strain-specific salutary effects may reflect strain-specific impacts on key phylotypes, strain-specific impacts that, of course, need to be interpreted within the, the entire microbiome because they all contribute to each other. Although translation of these findings remains a significant, to clinical populations, remains a significant challenge. Gut microbiota targeted probiotic intervention strategies may become an important element in diet and lifestyle alterations that will prevent or at least um, sort of attenuate obesity and related metabolic comorbidities. So I'll close there and quickly acknowledge uh, the Obesity Metabolism Lab, Andy, who's um, got me involved in all this madness to begin with, uh, Catherine Strissel, who was amazing and went to China and ran huge experiments there and brought back samples. Um, a big uh, shout out to the Nutrition and uh, Genomics Lab. Jose has been great, and the people in the lab have been instrumental in allowing me to like ask really dumb questions about Linux and, um, and statistics, especially Sarah Sloan. I thank them. And Anne, of course, and Albert, at, uh, who, Albert especially for helping me uh, figure out how to get things into LEFSA, and Anne for a uh, constant, um, a, a good sounding board. Uh, collaborators who provided the money and the uh, probiotic strains, and especially Johan, who's a really top-notch um, metagenomicist. And much of the work, um, and as many of the scripts were provided by Leaping Zhao's group at the Systems Biomedicine and Microbial Metabolism. This, is, this isn't even the whole title, but in Shanghai, especially Jian Shen, who is um, a young investigator who's um, really incredibly talented. Um, and financial support. So I'll stop there. I think I probably have run over and we don't have much time for questions, but thank you. Yeah, um, I think there, it depends whether you're looking at things like GALT and immune response or whether you're looking at metabolism. Um, they've been very instructive. For example, the demonstration that you can take one species from an obese human, you watch that species disappear when they lose weight or have bariatric surgery, you clone it out, you grow it, you put it into a, you know, you humanize a mouse with that one species and it gets fat on the same diet. It's really very powerful. The problem in my mind comes from 
not understanding the use of the germ-free mouse. Now think about it. The germ-free mouse is a mouse where we talk about all this co-regulation and all you know, the inextricable um, link between all the pathways in the host and the microbiota. This is a mouse that doesn't have any microbiota when it develops. Imagine doing that to a human infant, right? It's baby, the baby in the bubble. And then asking questions about physiology later on. Now you can ask good questions about immunology in a sort of a um, you know, proof of concept kind of experiment. But to under, my misgiving is, for example, if you take a germ-free mouse and you give it microbiota, it gets fat. Why? Because you generate short-chain fatty acids and you do all these things to bile acids and it gets fat. I just showed you that when you have more short-chain fatty acids in your fat, you actually get leaner. So we have to be very careful. I have to be, I don't know enough to know, to have an opinion about it other than the fact that it's, it's useful after you've shown that everything in the human, you've done all the experiments you can do in, as possible in humans. But I think they're, very, I think they're so, more solid looking at, at, at immune response and the development of, of t things like tolerance, things like that. Does that answer your question? But I mean, I think one problem with the humanized mice is that what part of the mice do you humanize? Because there's so many interactions with the gut microbiota from the different parts of the gut. Mm -hmm. And so you have a good model, but how do you, you know, what part of the mice do you humanize? Could you use it as a model? Yeah. That becomes a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Three mice, so, yeah. Uh, I have a question of uh, what your diet is in the animal study. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we couldn't get um, anything more complicated than the research diets to, you know, the one where they bring it, um, you know, it's a low versus high. I can show you. you. You know it. You know these diets. And the key was that we needed to get them irradiated. It's key to get them for these experiments, obviously. We had to get them irradiated. It's not the best diet. There's no question. So there's a, the issue is, are there other completely different, I mean, we, we have the lean mice that we watch, we follow all the way. In fact, we even have the lean mice before we begin the experiment, okay? And I didn't get into that, but there's an enormous aging effect. The, the microbiota sh uh, data I showed you are even more extreme, they're tremendously extreme when you compare the young mice to the mice when they fully develop. Um, that's a whole other study. Yeah, the, I wish the diets were better, but when you collaborate um, and the money goes, it gets crazy, so. But I, I agree, it's not the best diet.